okay, Yu-Gi-Oh, you did it. You got me invested in the girl character and whatever you plan on doing with her, and you were able to take your common mind control cliche and put it in a whole new direction. Don't screw this up, Yu-Gi-Oh. You've gone up to the bat five times with this one. Five times! And each time, you screwed it up at the end. You got real close once, and then you turned her into nothing but a set of boobs for the screen. You got real close last time, and you wasted it. Okay, you, you better not screw this up, but you better not screw this up. That was my little um, talking to a fictional TV show and to writers who don't know I exist. So, this episode, let's cut to the chase, people. Everyone who watches Yu-Gi-Oh! is talking about this episode right now. I saw on Twitter before I watched it, Rank 10 Yu-Gi-Oh! was basically sucking the dick of this episode. And honestly, after seeing it myself, I'm joining him. This was great. This was fantastic. I mean, legitimately, okay, like, yeah, later Rank 10 was like, yeah, it's a cautious going into, but it is really, really good. And first up, I want to start off with what is probably one of the best takeaways, the duel. Oh god, this was a fun duel. Trick stars were used amazingly. Where Gokis in the last duel was yeah, it fit in the go sort of idea. I'm going to let myself get pushed to the end so that way I can make my big comeback. That is not what happened here. She was all business. Like, she used every Trickstar card. She used all of them effectively the way you're supposed to use it. A lot of people discredit Trickstars and just view them as, like, a chance to make Chainburn big again. But in the anime and in a, a Vrain's Duel, where you have only 4,000 life points, that 200 damage multiple times a turn can get pretty scary pretty quickly. And not only just the way she played, but the way she was acted. I really loved the way the actress sort of does sort of this duality between Aoi and Blue Angel. They're the same character character, but they feel very different. And I love the way it doesn't feel like one is her natural voice, one isn't. There is her natural voice, which is bogged down by her sadness and her insecurities, but when she's Blue Angel and she talks, it feels like such a put-on, and that is worked in perfectly here. She very much feels like she's putting on a performance. She's glistening up, she's uh, making herself seem charming and attractive for the sake of making the duel entertaining for others. Again, hiding who she truly is inside. It's a br it's a brilliant performance and a great choice on the director to go this route. Again, it also serves as sort of a nice little thing with Playmaker, who's always just kind of intense all the time. And I also really want to point out, Ignis's comedy relief in this episode was great. I love this character's one-liners, and I thought it was really used effectively here. Like, every time he said something, I chuckled. If not for the f fact that the score in this episode, musically, Vrains hasn't, I thought, been amazing, um, especially coming off the Arc 5 score but I loved the way the music was used here. It felt like an idle performance, and the more I look at her, Blue Angel kind of looks like Hitatsuri Miku. I don't really follow that. I've just seen pictures of I'm pronouncing it wrong. Don't get on my case, people. But after that, oh, everything was so good. A lot of people, when they saw uh, Yusaku summon all those links against Go, started, uh, started doing memes of like, Yu-Gi-Oh's just going back to what it was. Links did nothing. I still really think it's fun watching all the crazy Link combos. Seeing Bitron, I love that Bitron actually has a cute voice. I, I know that doesn't really mean much, but it kind of means something to me. Um, as for what happened next, next in this. The duel itself, again, it's pretty fun. I want to save the mind control thing for the end, but I really loved everything with the brother. Um, I'm sorry, I can't seem to remember his name. It, they've only said it like once. Um, but anyways, I first up, can someone explain to me why they were referred to as in-laws last episode, but they're clearly biological here? <laughs> uh, I don't know what that means. But I loved the idea that they introduced that he's not some generic baddie. You could have taken away last week that he doesn't care about Aoi, that she, he just kind of sees her as a nuisance he's got to take care of. But no, we saw in this episode, she matters to him. That is the only thing he's done anything for, and his potential turn into darkness was probably fueled by just his desire to protect her and make a better life for her. I love when that can be done correctly. And Yu-Gi-Oh! is good with sympathetic villains. Or before Arc 5 used to be. So I would love if they could maybe do something here like this kind of anti-hero, middle-of-the-road type character. I really think that could be done super well. And I love the horror element of this episode. Then that gets me into the mind control thing. Yu-Gi-Oh! does mind control 
a lot, like a lot, a lot, and to varying degrees of success. What this episode did, this might not be the scariest use of mind control, but the way they did it sets it on its own and puts it on its own two feet. Basically, what happened here is Aoi played the card, and first up, what I loved is that she was beating Playmaker on her own, like with her own cards, no assistance. Yeah, Playmaker was trying to take advantage of it to set up his um, data skill or whatever the fuck it's called, but at the end of the day, he pretty much didn't realize this was going to happen. He just figured out how to take advantage of a dangerous situation, but he could have legitimately lost this duel. I never felt like Go was going to beat him. I had fun with that duel, and same with the uh, first duel, but this time, it legitimately felt like she could have kicked his ass. Like, it was awesome. But then when the mind control comes into it, it kind of reaches a new level of creepy. First up, I love sort of the dialogue kind of used with it. Someone referred to it that it's more like they hacked her than anything else, and that kind of affected here. I also love that when the mind control came into effect, it wasn't as simple as, now you're mine, little girl. It really felt like this very unnatural push and pull, like she's too strong for it to get her immediately, but like any normal human, not strong enough to keep it from getting her. And everything with the tears and the black aura, you could make the argument, yeah, maybe it's a little over the top, but I interpret it as, she's in pain. This hurts. Like, they're attacking her brain, man! And then, like, you get, like, the scenes where she's falling into the dark pit. Nice metaphor. I always love that kind of thing. Um, I sort of loved revolvers, sort of talking to her like maybe it's it just feels creepy and there's always the argument that when this kind of thing is done with a woman um to a man at least i forget what this is referred to as but it kind of feels scarier especially when the character is meant to be like cute and stuff but it really was creepy and it really created such a good atmosphere and i loved one thing i love that they brought into this was that she sort of felt like she was losing herself. That little dialogue, that little I'm Blue Angel, that little sense that she loses more of herself as this happens could really put this in some unique and interesting directions. Yu-Gi-Oh!'s mind control plot lines have pretty much always just reverted into being just a cheap excuse to pit certain characters against each other. But I would love if they could turn mind control into this, into this concept of like self-identity or self-worth or go into what it means to have something like that taken away with you. I'm not saying it's going to get like into Jessica Jones territory, but hey, you've got a protagonist who doesn't have much humanity, who is missing five years of his life, you could really go in some unique directions here. Like, a lot was opened up this episode, and oh, I just hope it goes with it. And based on the episode preview, like, you see Aoi in the hospital, the brothers, like, losing it, even Yusaku's getting legitimately pissed about this. I think that can set up so much, and I can't wait to see where this goes, and I love that this is the episode that seems to be getting people really into this, because right now, Yu-Gi-Oh! is behind in the ratings against Cardfight Vanguard and Duel Masters. It's gotta beat that shit. Like, it's gotta beat that into the ground and put that dick I was talking about in its ass. You hear me? You got that, guys? This got weird. But what did you think? In the comment section below, give me your thoughts on this episode. As for the TCG question of the week, the spoiler for the stupidest thing Konami has ever done, Pendulum Evolution, is up. And you know what? I think it's actually pretty good. They reprinted mostly good stuff. I was afraid they were going to reprint all the shitty Performer Pals. There are no Performer Pals on this. Like, they actually released... Um, the reprints are all good reprints. Um... The Ultras are all the new stuff, and if I'm correct, it's one Ultra, four Supers, so you buy a box, you kind of have the deck. Now, no one's going to buy a box. What do you guys think? You think maybe this was Konami's way of trying to get out of this, or just being like, look, we all know you just want to get all this Pendulum stuff over with, Let, let's just help you with that. But let me know in the comments below, and as always, click to like and click to subscribe, and join us again next week for wherever this insanity goes.